your attention. I want to thank you all for coming. I'm Marcy Winograd. Welcome to All Power Books in Los Angeles on International Human Rights Day, December 10th. When we call on the Biden administration to drop the extradition orders, the charges against Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks and publisher of U.S. war crimes in Iraq, Afghanistan, torture at Guantanamo Bay, cables, you'll hear all about those too, the diplomatic cables. So thank you for coming and thank you All Power Books for affording us this venue. We are live streaming on the Third Pink Facebook page and on the Instagram page of All Power Books. Our event is titled, Free Julian Assange, Defend the Press and the Public's Right to Know. I welcome you on behalf of Code Pink, Assange Defense, the Pasadena Foothill Chapter of the ACLU, LA Progressive, Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace, the National Lawyers Guild, and Progressive Democrats of America. After this program, please stay with us as my colleague, Medea Benjamin, a relentless anti-war activist and author, will talk about her new book she co-authored with Nicholas Jazz Davies, War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. Human Rights Day today is observed every year on December 10th. That's the day the United Nations adopted in 1948 the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is a milestone document that proclaims the inalienable rights that everyone is entitled to as a human being. The question is, how can we protect human rights without a free press to report violations of human rights? We can't. The prosecution of Julian Assange is a threat to press freedom everywhere, to the very foundation of democracy. Today, we will read what WikiLeaks made public in the New York Times, in The Guardian, and other news media. We will learn more about the Iraq and Afghan war logs, the Guantanamo Bay files and diplomatic cables that reveal the United States was supplying Israel with bunker buster weapons should Israel decide to attack Iran to halt its nuclear program. First, I'd like to introduce, I have the great pleasure of introducing my friend, Vincent Stefano is a lifelong, come on up here, a lifelong social <laughs> He is a founding member of the Assange Defense in Southern California, sits on the National Steering Committee, and was recently appointed as their National Organizing Director. He is currently president of the Pasadena Foothill Chapter of the ACLU and serves on the ACLU Affiliate Board and the Executive Committee. Vincent DiStefano has worked on police reform as a member of the Coalition for Increased Oversight of the Pasadena Police and has been involved with Amnesty International for over four decades. In 2019, Amnesty International recognized Vince DiStefano as the Urgent Action Letter Writer of the Year. Thank you. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank Code Pink, and particularly the incredibly epic Marcy Winograd for all she does. Just with her sister yes. in arms, Medea Benjamin. I, uh, I hope this won't appear terrible, but the best man for the job, Code Pink proves, is always a woman. The women that I am surrounded with, I am humbled by, by their activism, their strength, and their willingness to step up and do what is right. Now, I'm here to talk to you about Julian Assange. For those of you who don't know Australia, he's an Australian editor, publisher, and activist who founded WikiLeaks in 2006. Now, a note about WikiLeaks. The lion's share of the people that were there with him at the beginning were, again, women. Women help form the backbone of WikiLeaks, and I think it is incredibly important. Incredibly important to know that. WikiLeaks came to the attention, international attention, in 2010, 2011, when it published a series of leaks provided by the brave, the courageous your Army Intelligence Officer, Bradley Manning, now known as Ch Chelsea Manning. Those leaks included, if you have not seen it, the Baghdad airstrike titled, Collateral Murder 
video. That collateral murder video shows three verifiable war crimes that were committed in our name and with our tax dollars that were kept secret from the two reporters who were, uh, Reuters reporters who were killed there in an unarmed attack. The uh, first responders, the friends and neighbors that came to retrieve the bodies who were mercilessly shot down by the individuals in the Apache helicopter above, talking as if they were playing a video game. And of course, ultimately when the first, uh, uh, the, the ground forces arrived, they literally severed a body of one of the victims in half. Those are three verifiable war crimes, again, committed on our dollars and in our names. Now, he also introduced the Iraq War Logs in 2010 in October and the Guantanamo Bay Logs, a stain on the U.S. government that it is still open today. After the 2010 leaks, the United States government launched a criminal investigation into WikiLeaks and ultimately later charged him under the Espionage Act of 1917. Now, the Espionage Act is a particularly piece of cruel uh, 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 legal shenanigans that prevent someone providing a moral good as to why they're releasing the information they're releasing. Once uh, Assange eventually sought refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, and he was there for seven years. Now, when you think of an embassy, you probably think of Grand Palace uh, staircases, and chandeliers, but it was very a small place, about 900 square feet. And for the next seven years, he was trapped there under what Nils Milser called the UN Rapporteur on Torture, solitary confinement. He was ultimately dragged from asylum and taken off to Belmarsh Prison, where he has been under the harshest conditions for the last four years. Mind you, he has not yet been convicted of a crime, and yet the people who were in the collateral murder video, the people who fomented torture, the people who led us into the debacle that is the Iraq and Afghanistan's war, they walk free. Not only do they walk free, but they're on TV pontificating all the time on CNN, MSNBC, as if they were blameless. And yet Julian sits in prison. Now, um, the extradition charge was first launched by the Trump administration. Yes, we all know the Trump administration was terrible and horrible. But unfortunately, that extradition is being followed through by the Biden administration, in contradiction to what the Obama administration called the New York Times problem, meaning that if Julian is convicted on the charges he currently faces right now, it will spend, and this is not hyperbole, an end to freedom of the press as we know it. It may, literally makes any classified document radioactive. If you come into contact it in any way, you are guilty of the same crime as Julian Assange. Now, do we have to worry about the New York Times or the Washington Post? or any of the other papers that won Pulitzer Prizes from the information that Julian provided them as a journalist? No. Mm -hmm. But Substack, The Gray Zone, Consortium News, The LA Progressive, all of the alternative outlets that operate in a shoestring that most of the people in this audience get their news from, unbiased news that is not propaganda, they stand in jeopardy. It is not Julian that stands in the dock in the courtroom in Britain. It is all of us, and it is our right to know who stands there. Now, if he is convicted, and he will be, his case will be heard in the district court, Eastern District Court of Virginia, it is known as the rocket docket because it has a 98.2% conviction rate. So much for the presumption of innocence. He will spend 170 five years in jail for causing harm to individuals, to revealing state secrets? No, for simply alerting us to what our government is doing in our name and in our tax dollars. And he will, it will spell an end to the public's right to know. People like Daniel Ellsberg, right here behind me, I.F. Stone, Ida Tarbo, all of the muckrakers who use the government's own documents to show their malfeasance and crimes will be hampered from doing that in the future. 
And so, Marcy, I would like to turn it back to you. Oh, thank you so much. Let's give a hand to Vincent Escapino. Oh, yes. All the assigned defense. Thank you, Vincent. At this moment, I would like to call up a dear friend, singer-songwriter, Tom English, to sing a song that takes us to the heart of the matter, which is the horrors of war, right? Which Julian Assange revealed in publishing the Iraq and Afghan war logs. So Tom is going to sing a cappella, ah. a song from 19, what was it? World That's War I. World War I. Here we go. We'll see Matilda. Oh. This is good. So let me just put this thing aside. Yeah, I was uh, number two in the draft lottery, so I was uh, two years in uh, conscientious and dramatic dealing with uh, guys coming back from Vietnam strung out on heroin because of what they had to go through. <clears throat> so I, oh, yes. So, oh, Chelsea Manning, Julian. When I was a young lad, I carried me pack, and I lived the free life of a rover. From the Murray's green banks to the dusty outback, while well, I was to my Matilda all over. And in 1915, my country said, son, time's to stop roving, there's work to be done. And they gave me a tin hat, they gave me a gun, and they marched me away to the war. And the band played waltzing Matilda. And the band played waltzing Matilda. Oh, 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 God. <clears throat> And the band played waltzing Matilda as the ship sailed away from the quay. With the songs and the cheers, the flag waving and fears, we sailed off to Gallipoli. Tis well I remember that terrible day. Our blood stained the sand and the water. And how in that hell that we call Sula Bay, we were butchered like lambs at the slaughter. The big Turkish shell caught me ass overhead. And when I woke up, in my hospital bed, and I saw what it did. Well, I wished I was dead. Never knew there was worse things than dying. For I'll go no more waltzing Matilda. Along the green lands running free. For to hunt tents and eggs, Man needs both legs, no more waltzing Matilda for me. They gathered the wounded, the crippled, the main. They shipped us back home to Australia. The armless, the legless, the blind, the insane, us. Proud, wounded heroes of Sula. And as the boat sailed into Circular Quay, I looked at the place where my legs used to be, and thank God there was nobody waiting for me to mourn and to grieve and to pity. And the band played waltzing Matilda, 
as they wheeled us down the gangway. And nobody cheered. They just stood and stared. Then they all turned their faces away. And the band still plays waltzing Matilda. And the young men still answer the call. But as year follows year, more young men see things clear. Someday no one will march here at all. Tom English, singer-songwriter, thank you so much. Every time you sing that, it just reaches the innermost depths of my heart to return to this very uh, passionate space to challenge the whole institution of war. What a travesty. So here, today, at All Power Books in Los Angeles, we pay tribute to Julian Assange, the publisher, the whistleblower, who revealed the war crimes of the US government in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. At this time, I'm going to call up a few people to read headlines from 2021 and 2022 about Julian Assange's case. So Carol Francis, David Clinton, S.D. Chandler, Vince DiStefano, come on up. And maybe you can just stand uh, yeah, over there. And uh, I'm going to ask you, we'll start with, uh, we'll start with S.D. Chandler, um, and we'll share, share papers so you can see the headlines. Uh, and what I'd like you to read is just headline, January 6, 2021. You don't have to say story or anything like that. So these headlines are from Democracy Now!, okay? So let's go. Carol Francis. Headline, UK judge denies bail to Julian Assange 10 days after rejecting U.S. extradition bid. Headline, February 10th, 2021. U.S. to pursue extradition of Julian Assange as press freedom groups warn of dangerous precedent. June 11, 2021. Quote, Julian is suffering, unquote. Family of WikiLeaks founder Assange in U.S. to demand his release from prison. June 28, 2021. Attorney, U.S. case against Julian Assange falls apart as key witness says he lied to get immunity. July 20, 2021. Amnesty International. Julian Assange's arbitrary detention must end. Release him now. Story. September 28, 2021, the plot to kill Julian Assange. Report reveals CIA plan to kidnap and assassinate WikiLeaks founder. Headline, November 12, 2021, UK prison authorities allow Julian Assange to get married in prison. December 10th, 2021, quote, terrible step, end quote. Press freedom in danger as UK court clears the way for Julian Assange extradition to the United States. Headline, December 14th, 2021, Julian Assange suffered mini stroke in prison while fighting US extradition. Headline, December 30th, 2021, Chomsky blasts the torture of Julian Assange and Biden's provocative acts against China. Headline, January 4th, 2021, 2022, uh, Mexican president renews asylum offer to Julian Assange. Headline, January 24th, 2022, UK High Court rules Assange can request appeal of extradition to the U.S. Headline, April 1st, 2022, Chris Hedges on jail WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's wedding. He's, quote, crumbling 
unquote, in London prison. Headline, April 20th, 2022. UK judge okays extradition of Julian Assange to the US. Headline, June 8th, 2022. Spanish court summons Mike Pompeo over CIA plot to kidnap or kill Julian Assange. Headline, June 17th, 2022. Punish, uh, pu Punished for exposing war crimes, UK approves Assange extradition to US, faces 175 years in prison. Story, August 16, 2022. Mike Pompeo and the CIA sued for spying on Americans who visited Julian Assange in Ecuadorian embassy in UK. Headline, October 7, 2022. Julian Assange supporters Planned Saturday protests outside UK Parliament, US Justice Department. Headline, October 10th, 2022. Protesters form human chain around UK Parliament to demand freedom for Julian Assange. Story, December 6th, 2022. Publishing is not a crime. New York Times, The Guardian, and more. Five joint letters urge Biden administration to drop charges against Assange. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those and that's why we are here today. And so uh, today we're here at the All Power Books in Los Angeles, Code Pink, Assange Defense, lots of organizations sponsoring this, this very uh, meaningful and purposeful event to call on the Biden administration to free Julian Assange, to call on the British government to refuse extradition orders. All right, now, Medea Benjamin, my colleague, will step up, uh, the co-founder of Code Pink, author of 10 books, her latest being War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. She's going to talk about that in another hour right here. Uh, she's going to tell us about the media coverage of what WikiLeaks revealed. made the documents available under embargo to a number of media organizations, Der Spiegel, The Guardian, The New York Times, Al Jazeera, Le Monde, and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism and the Iraq Body Count Project. In October 2010, it was reported that WikiLeaks was planning to release up to 400,000 documents related to the Iraq War. Julian Assange initially denied the report, stating, WikiLeaks does not speak about upcoming pre press release dates. Indeed, with very rare exceptions, we do not communicate any specific information about upcoming releases, since that simply provides fodder for abusive organizations to get their spin machines ready. The Guardian reported on October 21, 2021, that it had received almost 400,000 Iraq War documents from WikiLeaks. On October 22nd, 2010, Al Jazeera was the first to release analyses of the leak, dubbed the War Logs. WikiLeaks posted a tweet that, quote, Al Jazeera have broken our embargo by 30 minutes. We release everyone from their Iraq War Log embargoes. This prompted other news organizations to release their articles based on the source material. Upon the lifting of the embargo, the media coverage by these groups was followed by further coverage by other media organizations. The Guardian said that, quote, the New York Times, Washington Post, and other papers were accused by web publications and some bloggers of downplaying the extent to which the documents revealed U.S. complicity in the torture and provided evidence that politicians in Washington lied about the failures of the U.S. military mission. Thank you, Medea Benjamin. Yay! Okay, so right now I want to introduce uh, two fine actors who are going to replicate an interview that was conducted by Time Magazine of Julian Assange. The interviewer, the reporter, an editor of Time Magazine was rather hostile. So uh, we are going to present excerpts 
from this interview. And Rico Ross, come on up. Bill Slade, Bill Slade. Hey, Rico. All right, and Dave Clennon, uh, who I used to watch. Reporter from Time Magazine, Rick Stengel. Hi, Mr. Assange. It's Rick Stengel. I'm the editor of Time Magazine. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. What is your reaction to Secretary Hillary Clinton's declaration that you put lives in jeopardy, and now the apparent attempts by the U.S. Justice Department to prosecute you? What is your reaction? And have you committed any crimes that they should be prosecuting you for? Well, this is sort of nonsense about uh, <laughs> living, about being alive, uh, you know, put, putting jeopardy of people in life. It's trotted around every time uh, a big military or intelligence organization is exposed by the press. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's nothing new. And it's not an exclusively American phenomena by any means. It goes back uh, at least uh, 50 years uh, and is extremely different in different forms uh, hundreds of years before that. So that sort of um, reactionary sentiment is, is equally expected. We get that sort of uh, thing nearly every post that we do. However, this organization in its four years of publish, publishing history we don't need to speculate. We, um, we don't need to speculate. It has, it has a history. History never caused an individual, as far as we can see, uh, as far as anyone can determine, uh, to come to any sort of physical harm or, or to be wrongly in, in prison and so on. So that. Um, that is the record compared to the organization that we are trying to expose who have literally been involved in the death of hundreds or thousands or potentially over the course of many years, millions. How would you characterize your actions, both in this latest set of weeks as well as in the past? Would you say you're practicing civil disobedience against breaking the law in order to expose greater law-breaking? Is that the moral calculus that you use to justify the leaks? Uh, no, not, not at all. This organization practices civil disobedience. Civil that is, obedience. That is, we are an organization that tries to make the world more civil and act against abusive organizations that are pushing it in the opposite direction. Uh, as far as the law, um, we have now in our four-year history had over a hundred legal attacks of various kinds and we have been victorious in all of those matters. Give a hand. Thank you. That was Rico Ross playing the role of Julian Assange, David Clennon, playing the role of the editor of Time Magazine. Well done. All right, now I want to introduce Carol Francis, who's very active with Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace, and she is going to tell us about the Afghan war logs that WikiLeaks uploaded. Julian Assange said the Afghan war logs was, quote, the most comprehensive history of a war ever to be published during this course of the war, end of quote. He compared the release of the war logs with the release of the Pentagon Papers in the 1970s. In an interview with Dos Spiegel, Hassan said that he believed the release would, quote, change public opinion, end of quote, and said, quote, the most dangerous men are those in charge of a war and they need to be stopped, end of quote. The leak, which is one of the largest in U.S. history, revealed information on the deaths of civilians, increased Taliban attacks, and involvement by 
Pakistanian and Iran and the insurgency. The New York Times described the leak as a quote, six year archive of classified military documents that offer the unvarnished and grim picture of the Afghan wars. Dor Spiegel wrote that quote, editor-in-chief of Spiegel, the New York Times, and The Guardian were in unanimous belief that there is a justified public interest in the material. What did the Afghan war logs reveal? On March 21st, 2007, paramilitaries fired on a civilian man who was running from them. The man, Shum Khan, was deaf and mute and didn't hear the warnings. In 2007, documents detail how the U.S. Special Forces dropped six 2,000-pound bombs on a compound where they believed a high-value individual was hiding after, quote, ensuring that there were no innocent Afghans in the surrounding area, end of quote. A senior U.S. commander reported 150 Taliban had been killed. However, locals record, reported that up to 300 civilians had died. <coughs> A significant number of do uh, documents describe unreported or previously misleading friendly fire incidences between Afghan police and army forces, coalition forces, and the U.S. military. The documents reveal that contractors for the U.S. had hired local male child prostitutes. Thank you. <laughs> Carol Francis with Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace on the Afghan War Logs. Now I would like to have David Quinnen and Rico Ross come on up. They're going to tell us about the Iraq War Logs, uh, what was in those. And I want to just clarify that uh, Julian Assange was the publisher, not the uploader, of this material. All right, so. The Iraq War Logs. The Iraq documents the leak is disclosed to WikiLeaks in, in the United States Army Field Reports, also called the Iraq War Logs, of the Iraq War from 2004 to 2009, and published on the internet in October 22 of 2010. The files recorded 66,000. 81 civilian deaths out of 100,009 recorded deaths. The leaks resulted in the Iraq body count projection adding 15,000 civilians' deaths to their count, bringing their total to over 150,000, with, with roughly 80% of those civilians. Mm. It is the biggest leak in the military history of the United States. Surprisingly, the Afghan war document leaked on, 20, on the 25th of July, 2010. Should I continue? Um, Dan's going to read this. And while he's uh, preparing, just, you know, to make it clear that Julian Assange is sitting in prison facing 175 years uh, while those who perpetrated these war crimes, President Bush is water, painting watercolors, appearing on Ellen, right? Uh, lawmakers who voted for this invasion and occupation of Iraq are still sitting in Congress and in higher offices. <laughs> on July 12th, 2007, a series of air-to-ground attacks were conducted by a team of two 
U.S. Apache helicopters in New Baghdad. On April 5, 2010, the attacks received worldwide coverage and controversy following the release of 39 minutes of gun sight footage by the internet whistleblower website WikiLeaks. The footage was portrayed as classified, but the individual who leaked it, U.S. Army soldier Chelsea Manning, testified in 2013 that the video was not classified. The video, which WikiLeaks titled Collateral Murder, showed the crew firing on a group of men and killing several of them, then laughing at some of the casualties, all of whom were civilians, including two Reuters journalists. Two Iraqi children were wounded. An anonymous U.S. military official confirmed the authenticity of the footage, which provoked global discussion on the legality and morality of the attacks. According to Al Jazeera English, some of the documents describe how almost 700 civilians were killed by U.S. troops for coming too close to checkpoints. Those killed included pregnant women and the mentally ill. The New York Times said the reports contain evidence of many abuses, including civilian deaths committed by private, for-profit contractors, such as Blackwater employees. <laughs> private contractors, such as Blackwater employees, described as firing indiscriminately at civilians. The Iraq war logs revealed the U.S. military handed over prisoners to the Iraqi Wolf Brigade, which was accused of beating prisoners, torturing them with electric drills, and executing suspects. Wired magazine reported that abuse of prisoners by Iraqi security continued even after the Abu Ghraib prisoner abuse came to light in 2004. Amnesty International said the U.S. military may have broken international law in handing over prisoners to Iraqi police knowing those prisoners would be tortured. Thank you. Those of us who are watching on the live stream, I'm Marcy Winograd. I'm with Code Pink here with Vincent DiStefano of Assange Defense and other organizations uh, sponsoring this event on International Human Rights Day. Uh, free Julian Assange, please write the Justice Department, go online, contact the Just Justice Department, hit submit, and tell them it is time to drop these extradition orders to drop these charges against Julian Assange and prosecute the warmongers, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Marcy, you can take direct action by going to assangedefense.org to the action page, and you can write directly to the president, to the secretary of state, and to the attorney general and call for the extradition charges to be dropped. If you are outside the United States, there are actions you can take that are appropriate to your country on AssangeDefense.org. And we did invite Attorney General Merrick Garland here. <laughs> he hasn't shown up yet. All right. I'd now like to call up a dear friend of mine, Esty Chandler, yes. who is on the board of Jewish Voice for Peace, longtime anti-war activist. And she is going to tell us about the, cable, the diplomatic cables that were released and what they had to say. On November 28, 2010, WikiLeaks began publishing classified documents and diplomatic cables sent from the United States Department of State to diplomatic missions around the world. A cable written in 2006 asserted that some multinational companies, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, Motorola, Dell, etc., complained to U.S. diplomats of being forced to pay bribes to Israeli authorities 
charged of overseeing the Kearney Crossing to have their products distributed into the Gaza Strip. The bribes allegedly occurred one year before Hamas won the 2006 Palestinian legislative elections and Israel imposed the economic embargo over Gaza. In 2008, Israel told U.S. officials that Israel would keep Gaza's economy, quote, on the brink of collapse, end quote, at a level just above that of a humanitarian crisis, according to U.S. diplomatic cables published by Norway's Aftenposten. Quote, as a part of their overall embargo plan against Gaza, Israeli officials have confirmed to U.S. Embassy economic officers on multiple occasions that they intend to keep the Gazan economy on the brink of collapse without quite pushing it over the edge, end quote. On November 3rd, 2008, U.S. Cable stated, Israel wanted to maintain Gaza, quote, functioning at the lowest level possible, consistent with avoiding a human, humanitarian crisis, end quote, according to the cable. In June 2009, Ehud Barak, Israel's defense minister, told U.S. congressmen that Israel, quote, saw 2010 as a pivotal year, end quote, in stopping Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, inferring that it would attack Iran if the weapons program was not stopped by then. This is the Israeli military's preferred option. Other revelations included that Israeli Mossad chief, Mayor Dagan, senior military men and diplomats repeatedly explained to various U.S. visitors Israel's concerns. The United States did not want it to be known that it was supplying bunker buster munitions that could be used for this purpose. In February 2010, Israeli Defense Force Advocate General, Major General Av Avichai Mandelbilt, revealed to James Cunningham, U.S. Ambassador to Israel, that the Israeli army had used drones in its fight against Gaza militants. The two men met to give the ambassador more information on the investigation of civilian deaths caused during Operation Cast Lead in Gaza in 2008-2009. According to the General Mandeville, 16 civilians were killed in Gaza when a drone fired against militants in front of a mosque. Most of them were praying inside the mosque. Thank you, Esty Chandler. <laughs> Now it is my great pleasure to bring up to the front uh, a man I've known for a long time. He was the program director at KPFK. He is the leader, the chair of Progressive Democrats of America, a nationwide organization. Uh, and uh, he is going to tell us about what we learned from WikiLeaks publishing the Guantanamo Bay Files. Alan Minsky. Yay! work and so my language is a little slippery so please bear with me. <laughs> um, the Guantanamo Bay Files Leak, also known as the Guantanamo Files or colloquially Gitmo Files, began on 24 April 2011 when WikiLeaks along with the New York Times, NPR and The Guardian and other independent news organizations began publishing 779 formerly secret documents relating to detainees at the United States Guantanamo Bay detention camp established in 2002 after its invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. The documents consist of classified assessments, interviews, and internal memos about detainees, which were written by the Pentagon's Joint Task Force Guantanamo, headquartered at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base. Media reports on the documents note that more than 150 innocent Afghans and Pakistanis, including farmers, chiefs, and drivers, were held for years 
without charges. The document also revealed that some of the prison's youngest and oldest detainees, who include Mohammed Sadiq, an 89-year-old man, and Akib Ula, a 14-year-old boy, suffered from fragile mental and physical conditions. The, Guardians note, the Guardian noted that despite the government's claim of having detained dangerous militants, the files, which covered almost all the prisoners held since 2002, revealed an emphasis on holding people to extract intelligence. Although many prisoners were assessed as not possessing a threat to security, they were nonetheless detained for years. The files showed that nearly 100 detainees had been diagnosed with depressive or psychotic illnesses. The United States tried to retain British nationals and legal residents, such as Jamal al Harith and Binyan Muhammad for intelligence value, although its agents knew neither were members of the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, and Muhammad had been tortured. So any quote-unquote evidence he provided was suspect due to the fact. The Guardian noted that the files revealed that the U.S. relied strongly on evidence obtained from a relatively few number of detainees, most of whom had been tortured. One detainee made allegations against more than 100 other detainees, so many that his accusations should, not have, been, should have been considered suspect. The U.S. issued guidance to its interrogators that was based on assumptions of threat based on flimsy associations. Uh, through attendance at particular mosques, stays at certain guest houses in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and other elements. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And before we bring this program to a close, I and I do want to thank All Power Books yes. for hosting this event. And I would like to thank our sponsoring organizations, Code Pink. Yay! Yay. at the QR code on the uh, notes that you have, and this will take you so you can immediately right. take action at the Assad right. Defense site, which will allow you to write to the President, the Secretary of State, and the Attorney General. And if you're like me and you're not that technically savvy, you can just Google the Justice just Department. Just Google Justice Department. And send them a message. Right. They'll ask you, uh, who do you want to address this to? Oh. Say, uh, go all the way to the bottom, and it will say, Attorney General. That's who we want the message sent to, right? He, Merrick Garland, has the power to drop this uh, extradition order, to drop these outrageous charges against a publisher of U.S. war crimes. We deserve to know what our government is doing in our name. So please follow up with that action. And I think it's almost time. Yes, what time is it? I don't know. Um, three minutes. Three minutes. Four o'clock. Uh, we have an event. That was a yeah, event really event. important. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to go right into it or. Uh, do people want a little break? Yeah. Little yeah. Break, yeah. Yeah. Let's break. Let's take five, yeah. five yeah. minute Thank break. You. Thank you. There are more seats up here if people want. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know it's it's using Google. Google. Um, it's um, can you find the same information on break.com, another I imagine, yes. I can move my car, actually. I don't know. 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 I don't